Further steep rise in water rates if state authorities adopt a rating scheme now operating in Newcastle. The controversial user pays scheme has already created a public controversy in Newcastle. And as our legal expert Andrew Watson reports, many homeowners are now facing a massive hike in their water rates. Newcastle. It's a city up in arms over water. Six weeks ago, the Hunter District Water Board introduced a user pays rating scheme. It works like this. The homeowner pays a fixed charge and on top a rate for water used. On a land value of $8,000, the fixed charge is $200. And if you use 200 kilolitres of water, your bill is boosted to $330. But if you use any more water, that's where you really get stung. And hardest hit will be businesses. Some face a 100% increase. Newcastle publican, Mark Regan. It's bad news for us. Um, last year, our water rates were approximately $8,500. This year, over $13,000, representing well over 40% increase for us. But the thing that has really stirred up Newcastle residents is a plan to charge a minimum of $400 in water rates on a vacant block of land with no water connections. The idea to curb land speculators, but local residents don't quite see it that way. I think that it's somewhat inequitable that uh, the sum of $400 would be levied under these circumstances. I think it's a rip-off, a big rip-off. You're paying for something you haven't got. Even the, even the gang said that America wouldn't get away with that. And despite the protests, Water Board President Dr John Patterson is determined to press on. But he admits some people are going to face steep increases. There'll be some that will pay a lot more and some that will pay a lot less. Amongst the residential group, we think about half will be better off and half will be worse off. Those that are worse off are those that use high amounts of water. And Dr Patterson says other water boards in the state are showing a keen interest in his controversial scheme. Andrew Watson, Eyewitness News. The response to the subject of this week's special report, When Punishment Fails, has been both strong and varied. Through the week, Daryl Hutchison has been following 16 young offenders as they undergo a revolutionary rehabilitation program, an attempt by the Department of Youth and Community Services to find a new solution to the high rate of reoffending. There are those among our viewers who claim the boys are getting not help, but a holiday. However, there are just as many others who consider the program a realistic attack on the problem of juvenile crime. Tonight, Dowell continues his report, this time from the National Capital. In the distance, Parliament House, Canberra. In the foreground, 16 young offenders near the end of their southern trip. Terry. Okay. Uh, look up at Terry. Have a smile. Big cheesy. For these boys, the visit to the national capital follows the more active pursuits of skiing and horse riding, their aim having been to teach self-reliance, develop self-esteem. Now is a time to relax. I have to get some yucky. No, Uncle Mal. Yep, Uncle Mal. We're going up He's my mate. Perhaps luckily for him, the Prime Minister makes no appearance, either here on the steps of Parliament, here in the War Memorial, as the boys study the instruments of war's past, or here at a Canberra restaurant, the last night dinner sponsored by Eyewitness News. With pre-employment training in Sydney yet to come, the program is far from over, but the general view finds it already a success. It's made me have a real good look at myself. What does that mean? Right. I'd have a look, you know, on like crime and that. There's no point in crime and that. What crimes have you committed? Past. Why? Why? Just nothing to do. Just. It's boring and that's so I just finish cars. It's learnt me to cope with myself, uh, to understand other people and myself, and to keep cope along with others. We learn how to control our tempo more, like instead of you know going really mad and chucking tantrums and that, we sort of controlled our tempo on it. All of us have had a really good look at ourselves and worked out why we've been getting into trouble. And, you know, if we, if we keep away from the same mates or just laugh at them and that, you know, we'll keep out of the trouble. I guess we've, we've learnt to rely on ourselves 
to look at ourselves more closely and to come to believe in ourselves that we can find the skills to survive in life. Is that going to help them? We hope it is. Is it going to stop them committing crimes? Well, I guess they've come to a better understanding of themselves. They've understood their own strengths and their own weaknesses, and they've been able to talk about making plans to remedy some of those weaknesses. And so in that sense, if they can remedy some of their weaknesses and rely on some of their strengths, they'll be able to make a go of life. And tomorrow, Darrell will be back with the final part of his report, examining the effectiveness of the whole program as the boys return to society. Tim. Yes, Kate, the possum has been laid to rest in a cemetery on the banks of the Murray River, the area where for the past 50 years he led the life of a hermit. His body was found in a badly decomposed state last week near Lock 8, west of Wentworth on the Victoria-New South Wales border. The possum was a living legend in the area, and although he had virtually no contact with other people, there was a big turnout at his funeral. Reporter Terry Plain was among them today. They put the possum in the ground just a few hundred yards from where he died, near his beloved River Murray. And people came from miles around, from the Riverland, from the Sunraysia, and from the southwest of New South Wales. More than 150 of them, police officers, farmers, and of course the media. Ironically, a man who in life was a bushbound recluse for more than 50 years, tonight in death is a national identity. He lived on nature and he died with nothing. The burial on the old one Goma station between Renmark and Wentworth, just near Lock 8, was arranged by Mildura newspaper man Alan Erskine. Even at the funeral, people were coming up to Erskine, slipping him envelopes with a few dollars in. People who'd never met the possum, people who'd only seen his back disappearing down the track with a chook under his arm, and even a few that had met him and talked with him. The headstone says David James Jones, may he rest where he roamed. There's no doubt Jimmy the Possum lived the river and the country around it. And although of all the people at the funeral, only one shed a tear, there's little doubt that they loved having him around. Sure, he stole from a lot of them, but he usually thanked them with a little task in return, a mended fence, wood chopped, or just some tidying up. And besides, legends aren't easy come by these days. Terry Plain, Eyewitness News. Action 9 uncovers a disturbing situation in orphans' pensions. That story next.